Welcome to Noble Warrior. This is a place where entrepreneurs talk about what it takes to create a life of purpose. We're going to talk about mindset, mental models, actionable tactics, such that you can take everything you learn and go out and create a life of purpose for you. My next guest is the founder of Life in Tune. He's best known as the Grammy-nominated artist of Earth, Wind, and Fire. He's playing alongside some of the legendary artists of our time, Madonna, Carlos Santana, Prince. He's known as the keynote maestro, helping Fortune 100 companies taking business chaos into business harmony. Please welcome Freddie Ravel. Yes, hey. Hi, CK. Thank you so much for being here, Freddie. Really, really appreciate you. My pleasure. Um, one of the, the, the things that really inspired me right away when I met you is music is something that is so embodying you, right? And, and for, for me, you're just exuding joy and life and aliveness. It is so intoxicating. So I'm curious to know from your perspective, what are some of the personal practices you have to step into this higher vibration? Well, thank you, CK. I would, I'd have to say that one of the one of the most important things is what you and I did just before we jumped on this this uh, broadcast, and that was a breathing exercise that, that that you guided me through. But that's the thing I also do every day. I I have four things that I do. I scrape the tongue. I get up in the morning and I scrape my tongue right when I get get out of bed. That's something that comes from India. It's a very ancient practice, but I think it's very important. The second one is uh, salute the sun, which is a yoga salutation. It's called the sun salutation in yoga. It's uh, 12 different poses. So I do that. In fact, in my studio, I even have a yoga mat behind me. <laughs> and uh, I keep it there. I always have something about having a mat close to where I work. It makes me, it makes me feel guilty if I don't jump on it. <laughs> mm. So I do that. So, and the third one is uh, breathe. I do reverse nostril breathing. And the fourth one is meditate. So that practice, scrape the tongue, salute the sun, breathe and meditate. I've been doing that for about over 25 years. Amazing. So this is part of your discipline as a way to set up your day. Practice. Yeah, def definite practice. So you mentioned a few things that I had no idea what you were referring to. What's reverse breathing and, and also what kind of meditation do you do specifically? Okay, so it's called reverse nostril breathing. Mm -hmm. So it's, it involves the nose, it involves the nostrils. And uh, what it is, is you take the, in my case, I take my left hand and I take my left thumb and I cover my left nostril. And then I take my left index finger and I'm going to alternate between my thumb and my index finger. So I put the thumb over the left nostril and I breathe in only through my nose. Then I cover my right nostril with my index finger and I blow out through the other nostril. Two more times. In, out, in, out. And then when you release it, Take a deep breath with both nostrils and you should feel a kind of a rush of oxygen to the brain. Probably a little bit of dopamine and oxytocin too. That helps okay. me a lot, CK. You know, because when you get out of bed, you got gunk in your throat and you got gunk in your brain. You're coming out of sleep. So I don't think you can just, you know, some people in our culture will say, I just need my first cup of coffee and I'm ready to go. I think you got to do more than the coffee. Although I love coffee, don't get me wrong, but I think you got to do I think you got to awaken the body and awaken the the lungs and get the air and the oxygen in you. So that's why I do that. I love it. That's also from Ayurvedic and India, reverse uh, you can google this reverse nostril breathing. But basically what I shared is the essence of what it is. So it's a way to reset essentially your cognitive mind to get ready for the day. Yeah. Did you read that book, Breath? It came out a couple of months ago. I did not. So breathing, so I'm a 
PhD trained by a medical engineer. So in my mind, when in my younger days, I didn't understand like what's the whole big deal about breath, right? You, essentially, if you sum it down to the mechanical function of breathing is getting oxygen into your body and get carbon dioxide out. But it wasn't until I experienced psychedelics and start to explore this whole realm of consciousness, breath work, and I was like, wow, this is, uh, there is a lot there. And there's a lot of deeper wisdom in just the way we breathe. So this book, Breath, actually went into a variety of different uh, ways. These, uh, they call them uh, breath knots. So kind of like psychonauts, but like who just use breath mm -hmm. as a way to explore their consciousness. Breath okay. enough, if I, if I, if I recall correctly, and it went into a scientific studies and understanding of essentially breath. So for someone who really appreciates breath, I think you would really like that as well. Okay. I want to share one practice with you, by the way, Please. One thing that I do, I, I learned recently it actually helps me sleep, believe it or not. I learned this from this deep dive athlete who basically holds world records of, you know, holding the longest breath, going as deep as possible. Okay. And here, one specific technique essentially is you hold your breath as long as you can. And then you exhale. And then you take a deep breath in, deep breath in again, hold it, and then let everything go. Yeah. So I do that right before I go to sleep. So instead of taking melatonin or some other methodologies or tools as a way to put myself in a more relaxed mode, relaxation mode, doing this practice actually helps me go to sleep even faster. So just want to uh, share. Yeah. That's a great one. If we're talking about sleep, I swim about five days a week. I, I was in the water literally an hour ago, just an hour ago swimming. And I swim probably about, oh, about a half a mile to three quarters of a mile, when, five days a week. That relaxes me better than any other exercise I know. Uh, so mm. that's, you know, while we're talking about practices and breathing, swimming is another one that my whole muscles get very calm, my complete body. And I just feel very relaxed. And then that allows me to, when I got to get energized and get ready to tackle the day or, or do interviews or do, or, or write books or, or perform uh, or deliver a speech, I'm ready to, I'm ready to rock and roll. So you do this right before you perform or write or give a speech? Yeah, I swim every day. I don't have control of the time that my health club has a lane available during a pandemic. So I book things in advance and sometimes they can get me in in the morning. Sometimes they can get me in in the afternoon, but I make it a point, no matter what time, I don't care if it's 6 a.m. or 5 p.m., I'll, I'll structure my week in a very deliberate way to make sure I can get in that, that swimming because that is the total, to me, that's the ultimate. Plus it's, it's you're by yourself. It's just you in the water and there's something very meditative about swimming. Yeah. You know, later today, I'm also going to go uh, mountain bike riding with my son. I have a 14 year old oh, son and uh, we'll, we'll take, we live very close to the Santa Monica mountains and we'll do, we'll get We'll get a, a ride in today. Yeah, so to me, if you can burn about a thousand calories a day, mixing it up with, you know, scrape the tongue, salute the sun, breathe and meditate is always seven days a week in the morning. Mm. But I, I interject that with swimming and cycling and hiking, just like we did a couple of days ago, CK, we were on a hike together. So yeah. that to me is the combination of all that's really great. Living, living in California is helpful because we have pretty good weather. So that allows me to, to, to do these things and, and, and be with people like you. Yeah, easy access. I love that. So why not hone in on this whole theme of living at a higher vibration? Because to me, you are a high vibrational human being slash alien, right? Who is just <laughs> vibing at a high level. And, and, and part of what you do, you public facing as a performer, as a speaker, you need to vibrate at an even higher level 
such that when people receive your message, they can elevate their vibration. Does that make sense? Totally. So I'm curious to know, what are some of the ways that you do right before you're about to perform, right before you're about to give a speech? Because if when I watch you perform, it comes through the screen, it's electrifying, it's charismatic, it's just like, wow, you know, aspirational. So what do you do to amp it up even more right before you're about to transmit that energy to thousands or tens of thousands or even hundreds of thousands of people? Thank you, CK. I, I like rhythm. I love rhythm. Uh, rhythm is, is sort of the root chakra, you know, finding the, the, the beat that you feel in your solar plexus, you know, uh, the reason people tap their foot, the reason people dance, the reason people are moving around is because they feel rhythm. And I always tell people by virtue of having a heartbeat, you've got a drummer inside of you. All of us have this living drummer inside of us. And, and you being who you are, CK, you, you're going to know all this much deeper than I will, but the heart uh, beats at approximately 76 beats per minute. And so if you know that you've got this tempo, and this is about where that's at, you kind of understand the pacing of the human body. There's uh, certain aspects of music that are in sync with the circadian rhythms of the body and in the way we think and the way we move. For example, the cha-cha-cha is a very common dance. It's, you know, one, two, cha-cha-cha, one, two, cha-cha-cha. I've gone all over the world and I tell the audience to go clap, 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 clap. It's boom, boom, cha-cha-cha, boom, boom, cha-cha-cha. The moment you clap this rhythm, Everyone in the world instantly starts clapping it. And I've done this in Singapore, and I've done this in Macau, China, and I've done this in Kentucky. And people will clap this rhythm, right? The tempo of the cha-cha-cha is at about e, 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 a little faster than the human heartbeat. But it's a tempo that people can kind of move their arms to. I'm doing this on camera, everybody, if you're listening, but I'm kind of swaying back and forth, moving my, my hips to the rhythm. And when I used to play with Carlos Santana, um, who has been, a, his career is over a half a century old. He sold over a hundred million albums. He's a, he's really a living treasure. This, this guy's career was pretty much built on the cha-cha-cha hmm. music. You know, some of his songs, I have my piano right here, but he has a song called Oye Como Va that goes... Hmm. to change your evil ways, mm -mm, baby. Mm -mm. So all these songs, oye como va, all these songs are cha-cha-cha, mm -mm, mm -mm, cha-cha-cha. The reason I mention this, because you're asking about rhythms and what do I do to get into state before I hit the stage. Mm -hmm. Before I hit the stage, my foot is tapping and I'm feeling the rhythm. Now, if I have a drummer on the stage, I will tell the drummer, I'll be at the side of the curtains and I go one, two, and I'll ask them to start playing a rhythm for me because the drummer will get the audience in state. Mm. And it's much easier to hit the stage when your audience is already in state. Mm, 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 mm. So if I've got a room of 500 people going, oh, yes, go, 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 and they're like this, and I haven't even walked on stage yet, CK. I haven't opened my mouth. They don't even see me yet. It's a huge advantage. <laughs> you know, if you, for those of you who've ever attended a church service anywhere, every pastor tells me, they say, Freddie, I'm so jealous about music because you guys get the music going and it takes me, the, the pastor, 20 minutes just to get the congregation interested in what I'm saying. But in music, it's not 20 minutes, it's about 20 seconds. And people are up on their feet and they're clapping. So, one of the great advantages of music is it gets people into state 
quickly. Mm -hmm. And that's the reason that every convention, every event you go to, it doesn't matter what the conference is about. They're going to have some sort of music there to mm. make the room feel good. And, and by the way, music is a part of our lives, whether we know it or not. You walk into a supermarket, for example, and if you're paying a little bit of attention, there will always be music in the market mm. or there's music in the malls or wherever you travel or uh, any a theme park like Disneyland is going to have music constantly everywhere. Why? Because music puts the subconscious mind in a state. Yeah, I love that. So, do you? Uh, so, so similarly, when you see an NBA players before they walk in the game, Dennis Rodman famously you know, he just has his headphones on before paying attention to anyone else. Do you? play music before you go on stage? I play music before I go on stage. I have a, I, I have a warm up, a sizzle reel that goes on for about a minute. And uh, I've done many events. I've been, I've been really lucky CK. I've had the privilege of being able to speak in 82 countries. And over the years, I've had different people introduce me. We got, a, there was one gentleman from Australia and I was making a presentation in Shanghai. And this uh, announcer that was bringing me on was a great Australian announcer. I mean, he was fantastic. He's a pretty famous actor in Australia. He brought me on stage. And uh, we kept that clip. And we used that clip to bring me on stage all over the world. Mm. Um, and he sets the whole thing up about my background and everything. And that, that kicks into a song that has a, I can hear your hands clap. And, and then I go, up on, I go up on the piano and I start jamming. I haven't said one word. I have someone else introduce. I hit the stage and maybe about a minute and a half into it, I, the song ends. And by that time, the audience is already We've established what I do. We've established the energy. We've established the optimism. We've established a tone of joy. And the room has shifted. And I yeah. haven't even said one word. No, I mean, that's a pretty ninja technique. Because yeah. you can control you know, how you want to be introduced. You can control the energy of the room. You can control the credibility already versus leaving it at some MC that you don't even know. So th thank you for sharing that. It also sounds like you, it's also a way to program yourself because when you hear that trailer playing, you put yourself, you train yourself in the mind of like, all right, game time, let's go like that too, right? I mean, uh, think about politicians that use music before they walk on stage, you know, there's many, you know, er almost every politician is running for office and we just went, we're, we're speaking one day after the most, the biggest election of the United States, right? And it's still going on. But, but the point is, is that all those uh, people running for office, if they're going to hit the stage, they don't go on with silence or with just the audience clapping. They go on with music in some form or another. And usually the music is tapped into their, somehow into their campaign message. So... Yeah. Pastors, priests, politicians, actors, actresses, speakers, everyone is using music. And p music tends to be an afterthought or it tends to be viewed as entertainment. But I'm here to tell you, CK, music is a multitasking power tool to enhance the way we live. A tool that can help us lead better, help us collaborate on a higher level, and help us Stay in rhythm and stay in sync, especially now in this time of the pandemic and when people are so out of rhythm. I mean, most people are have completely lost a sense of their tempo and their timing because the clock is liquid, deadlines are liquid, where are we headed? Uh, a lot of people are not clear what their next career move is going to be. And by the way, it's not just career. 
Where are they going with their relationships? What about their love life? What about if they have a family, their children, their parents? There's a sense of smoke and ambiguity right now. People are sort of in a wait and see mode. And I'm here to tell you that if you're in wait and see, it means you're not in rhythm. Mm. So finding a way to stay on purpose, to, to really speak to what you do, CK, to really support Noble Warrior, how do you have a purpose-driven business? How do, you, how do you stay? And rhythm has everything to do with it. Rhythm is associated with timing, tempo. Are we going to get this done quickly? Do we have a deadline this Friday? We better move pretty quickly. Or do we have about a month before we got the, to release the new book or blog or newsletter or advertising campaign? And if we have the luxury of a little more time, maybe we could make it a deeper campaign and touch people on a deeper way because we're taking more time to think about the messaging, right? There's many angles to it. Sometimes we have to move quickly. Sometimes we only have a moment to get a message out. Sometimes we have the luxury of time. I mean, I, I, I love what you're saying. I, I love the, the metaphor of music and breaking that down into, I know you have your particular you know, rhythm, uh, harmony, and I can't remember the other two. As a Melody, way- harmony, and rhythm. Right, as a way, yeah. to, as a way to live our life. So uh, a loving challenge here is the entrepreneur world, the, the masculine, you know, the yang approach to life is go, 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 right? Yeah. Faster, the better. <laughs> but in reality, faster is not always better because if you, so can you speak on finding the rhythm that's aligned, congruent to what's happening internally as well as externally? So you, so you, you get in harmony rather than rushing the song. Does that make sense? Yeah. You're, t- you're talking about how to st- how to find your tempo Mm -hmm. and how to see if you're in sync. Mm -hmm. So there's two things, right? So right now, CK, you and I, for example, you and I are in a state of harmony right now. We have the two of us looking at each other. We're in our respective studios. We're in a spirit of collaboration. And our number one goal is to impart value to your wonderful audience, right? That's my, my purpose here is to support your audience and people that are behind Noble Warrior. And so in the spirit of supporting where I am, where we are, the first thought is there's nothing more important than the present moment. That's like the first principle. In other words, living in the moment, you know, Eckhart Tolle, the power of now, he talks about that. A lot. But most people will tell you that if you can be as present as possible, then you're living life as richly as you can. So in this moment, 1230 p.m. November 4th, 2020 Pacific Standard Time, I have the honor and privilege to be with my new friend and colleague, C.K. Lin. And my goal in this moment is to focus on nothing else but being with you and not thinking about anything else and thinking about what tools. So uh, being very aware of being in your body, in your mind, with the person in front of you, that's principle number one. Now you speak to me in a very, you have a warm, low, direct, and and very clear voice and a beautiful smile, I might add. So when I see your energy, CK, I get all lit up and I don't speak to you quickly. I don't, you know, if I, my next call, I'm going to be talking to some people from Mexico, right? Ellos hablan muy español. Mira, yo soy de México. Vamos a hablar y vamos a hablar de una cosa que estamos presentando. And, you know, it's español, it's Spanish, right? It's moving quickly. There's a certain energy of the Latin energy. So I become a chameleon and my tempo is faster. Mm. But in this broadcast, we're, we're, we're speaking at a rhythm where there can be space between my words. And in the space, I can dip into my intention in creating a slower tempo. And by creating a slower tempo, we create space 
between our words. And by creating space between our words, we allow the listener to hear their own thoughts. And that's when I believe we can connect at the deepest level. When, when we're living in what is often referred to as namaste consciousness, right? The light in me recognizes and honors the light in you, right? Now, that's an ancient word, a Sanskrit word, right? Again, we, we're, we go back to India and we go back to China. And these are the, the most, the oldest, you know, 5,000-year-old cultures on our planet. So, and include, let's not leave out Africa, but that's another discussion. But they are ancient cultures. And these cultures have certain golden rules that we can apply in today's world. So, and by the way, music is way older than all those cultures. <laughs> music is the oldest language in the world. You know, we say China and India are 5,000 years old. Well, CK, they found a flute in Germany a couple of years ago. A flute. It's made out of a vulture's bone. And mm. they, carb they carbon dated the fossil of the bone. Mm. And it's, they, they, they all concluded that it's 43,000 years old. Wow. So think about that, right? Uh, the, the written word and the spoken word, about 5,000 years that we've been using the written word and coming up with words for language. But music, people were blowing on flutes 40, at least 43,000 years, probably much more. They were drumming, they were singing, they were playing, they were pounding, they were yelling, they were screaming, but they were using some form of harmonic resonance to communicate and music is a is a system that is as ancient as anything we've ever seen in terms of communication yeah i mean it's, it's such a primal aspect of who we are as human beings is rich in history and as you said it's the fastest way to get 10,000 people aligned in 10 seconds or 20 seconds, however long that is, is faster than anything. And I, I'm recalling my conversation with Maury Hittery, another beautiful philosopher, entrepreneur, also using music as a tool to uh, get people aligned in their mind. Oh, yeah. um, and he talked about that as well. So I'm curious from your perspective. So let me actually do a quick recap and then I'll ask you the next question. So what I heard, so the question that we were asking originally was, how do I know that I'm in the right rhythm? So what I heard is being the present moment, here and now, not in the past, or not being anxious about the future. In here and now, and just appreciate this moment. And also meet the other person where they're at. So in, 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 in this case, you slow down, you give a little bit more spaciousness, because we're going deeper to allow people the space and time to reflect whatever we say themselves versus your next call dealing with Mexico culturally to just speak faster than therefore you also amp up your energy meeting them where they're at. Is that an accurate reflection of what you said? Very accurate. Very accurate because every, every human being is a culture within themselves. Every human being, it's not, you're not just talking to one, you, you might be a face to face conversation, but if you take in the deeper elements of the conversation, you might pick up on the fact that they may be from a certain country. You might pick up from the fact that English is their main or their second language. You might pick up from the fact that they eat a certain way, they have a certain kind of food, they dress a certain way. And if you're sensitive, to these many signals that are coming at you, it will shape the tempo at which you communicate. So what I'm saying is you want your rhythm to match or mirror the person you're having conversation with. And that's a, that's a technique that musicians use constantly to make music together. In fact, if musicians don't do that, we get fired immediately. We'll never get asked back to the stage if we're playing faster than the person we're sharing the stage with or slower. So it's very important to match the energy. And in music, it's so critical, you're not only matching it, but you're blending energies. And it affects the outcome and it affects the beauty or the failure 
of the song that you're making or the music you're making. Yeah, the, the music is more important than the egoic self-expression or the identity, the look at me, look at me, or paying too much reverence to, to, to others. It's about the music that's being presented, yeah? yeah totally. So follow-up question. I'm very curious because you have worked with some of the legends of our time. Carlos Santana, Madonna, Prince, beautiful people, human beings. I'm sure many, many others, right? So curious might want to know, are they more special than the rest of us? Are they, you know, high vibration aliens as the media would like to portray that they are, or are they just as human as we are, but with a few degrees of tweaks and anyways, I'm just curious if you can share a little bit more about the, what you learn from being with these legendary artists. Okay. Amazing question. First of all, I do believe that each of us have a divinity and have an area where we can be the, our own superstars in our own way. Let me start that way. I think everybody listening to this podcast and everybody that we encounter in life, if they can find what their superpower is, their talent, and by the way, it can be anything. It could be a person who makes baskets, beautiful, incredible baskets. They have ability to make baskets. It could be a farmer who has a, an innate sense for the timing to plant seeds and make harvest happen. It can be a, a, a cook, right, who understands the alchemy of food, right? I believe there's a Carlos Santana or a Madonna or a Lady Gaga or whoever you admire, if you admire any of those musicians, in all of it. There's a Mozart that lives inside all of us, okay? So I want to start off by saying that. Now, in the case of people like a Carlos Santana, Carlos is like, you, you called me an alien at the top of this broadcast. <laughs> I've never been called an alien before, but if we, if we consider that a possibility. A high vibration alien. A high say. vibration a alien. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll, yeah. Hey, I'm not going to argue with that. Maybe, maybe I didn't come from this planet. I don't know. But yeah. if, there, if there are high vibration aliens as a true phenomena, Carlos could probably be the king of a certain mm -hmm. sector of the galaxy. In mm -hmm. other words, he is exceptional. A lot of it is, of course, he's human. And of course, he's got all kinds of issues like everyone else does. That's, that comes with the package of being a human being. All of us do. But he does hear and feel the energy of the present moment in a, in a very unique way. And he's able to synthesize things very quickly and he's able to bring them to his fingers and he's able to hit that guitar in a way that has given him a stunning, almost unprecedented career as a guitar player that no other guitar player can touch. He's, 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 there's very few people that can do what he's done and unify Africa, South America, jazz, pop, European rhythms, Asia. He can mix all these things into music and not everyone can do that. So, they do have special access to the feel and the expression that not everyone, you can't get, you, I don't think you can go to school and learn that. I think certain people are, there's a combination as, as you know, of nature and nurture. Certain talents we can nurture. You can go to a dojo and learn all the moves and you can emerge from the dojo as a certain level of mastery, but there's some, some people that decide to become warriors that are gifted and they, and they just instantly learn things quickly and yeah. they, they develop their own style of fighting and protecting, right? They, they become their own unique war. Bruce Lee is, 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 is probably one of the most famous of people that didn't just do martial arts. He took it to another level. Santana's like a Bruce Lee of, of the guitar, right? It's unique. They have so, a unique access. So, so, so I want to dive deeper there. And, and by the way, I'm as, I'm, I am ask you a leading question, not because I'm fawning over celebrities and think they're special. 
like you believe that there's genius in every single one of us. Mm. It takes cultivation and discipline to uncover, to excavate that genius, right? Mm. So, so I want to ask you, since you've worked with some of the greats, I want to ask you what disciplines that they have uh, done daily or regularly as a way to hone their awareness, hone their self-expression, hone their genius in spite of being in perfectly perfect human being that they are. One of the things that I've seen in all, all the greats is an ability to, they're, they're, they're students, they study a lot. Now they don't study necessarily the way, not like an academic thing. They don't, they don't have a zillion books and they're constantly reading them. I don't mean it that way. When I was working with Carlos, at the time, 10 years ago, when I was working with him, he had an uh, iPod. One iPod had about 100 hours of music or 1,000 hours of music on it. And this iPod was just going to be Miles Davis. I'm just going to listen to Miles Davis. That, that iPod was just that. Then he had another one, 1,000 hours of music, ex, you know, specifically from Africa, specifically, mm. nothing else. So he would just disconnect his headphones, plug them into the Africa, and all day long, he would listen to African rhythms. Mm. Um, mm. The next day, we listened to John Coltrane, the great jazz saxophonist, right? He was interested in daily taking a sonic bath of the greats. Mm. And he would learn by, by processing and listening. Okay? So that's... That's something to think about. You know, I think all of us need to learn how we study, how we learn. For me, I am, I am a terribly curious person. I am very curious. I like to tell people that we are teachers sometimes, but students all the time. Every moment we're alive, we're a student, hopefully. And uh, when we can teach, that's a privilege because we're able, it's a moment where we can share knowledge and wisdom. So I, I, I just want to, you know, encourage people to consider that. It's very important. So let me do a quick recap and ask your follow-up question. So what you said is Carlos Santana, uh, a lifelong student, he has, he immersed himself musically through whatever interest that he has. That's a way of his part of being the greats. Yeah. And for you, you, the way you learn is being students most of the time and then teacher some of the time. Yeah. Is that an accurate reflection? Uh, being a student all of the time. That's right. That's right. And a so, teacher every now and then. So one of the things I really appreciate about you is not only you live your life, you know, a uh, high vibrational alien that you are, right? It bring joy and enthusiasm and passion. Anyone who pays any kind of attention receive that right away. And you're also very uh, good at articulating the thought process because some people may be living it, but they have no way of articulating, transfer that knowledge to someone else. And you, my friend, are very gifted with words. So. Can you dive in more deeply into your meta learning process? So that way, I'm sure there's something that you're learning right now. Can you break it down for us step by step or the way you think about it? So that way you can achieve a, a high level of competency going from uncompetent, competent to compass, in, uh, incompetent to compass, competent to uh, unconscious competence very quickly. Can you share with us your learning process, please? There's two things that I like to think about, but I don't, they, they really operate more on the subconscious. One of them is there's a, we're living in a sense of a linear, we live under the illusion that time is completely linear, right? So I'm talking to you. I, I mentioned about 16 minutes ago that it was 1230, right? Now it's 1246. That's linear. I'm living, we're living in, in measured time. But then there's another reality that to me is timeless. And timeless is, is another state where time doesn't operate 
in you know 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. <laughs> I believe there is another place we can live in our mind and in our thoughts. So when I'm ac- when I'm thinking about timelessness, I can as- I tend to associate that with certain sounds because that's my the way my brain is wired, right? And so when I think of certain sounds, I time, time stretches. So like if, I'm, if I have my keyboard here and I think of, let's say, a sound like this. I'm not thinking of a tempo. I didn't think of tempo, I didn't think of time, but I thought of where I was. And I went, okay, I'm breathing deeply. I'm really calm. I'm kind of feeling, I see a blue sky outside. So I tended to play in kind of celebration of that energy. If there was a storm outside and we were having distractions, I'd probably play something more aggressive. So. For me, a lot of it is timing has two pieces. It's linear, just like my watch, and it's measurable. That's linear time. And then there's the timelessness. There's, again, going back to being in the moment. And sometimes the moment doesn't want to be 10 seconds long. It wants to be 10 minutes long. You know, Those moments in your life when you, let's say you're, you're, you're aspiring to climb to the top of a mountain. And when you get to the top of the mountain, you want to take five or 10 minutes at least to take in the view and to look down at, at what you accomplished climbing the mountain and, and, and appreciate where you are and perhaps have a moment of gratitude, which is, I think, a very important emotion to integrate daily. That's another thing we have yet to really talk about. But gratitude is one of those superpower attitudes that will propel you into, it will surprise you. Uh, before we go there, before yeah. we go to gratitude, I, I want to dive into the way of being and gratitude and all that, but pause on that for a moment. I want to go a little bit more granular on your learning process. So what I heard you say is everything that's in your environment we actually had a conversation about how you saw a house and, you know, <laughs> and oh, then yeah. how able to create melody just in your head because everything you see is through the lens of acoustic and music and, and sound. So, so, so when you learn, I'm assuming, correct me if I'm wrong, you put, you play some music in the background as a way to enhance your learning cognitive ability. Is that an accurate projection or no? I don't know if it's music. I'm, I'm, I have an immediate flashback, CK. You and I were on a trail in the back of the Santa Monica Mountains. We were halfway up the mountain. We were descending. The, the hike was coming to an end. To our left, I can, I can, I have, a, I can, I can see it like, it, like we're looking at it right now. Was this house that was jutting out, a very modern house, jutting out into the mountain, built like something from outer space, made out of glass and iron if you remember that place. And so when I saw that and you asked me a question, it triggered 10 different things at one time. And I didn't feel music. I felt, I think I went to rhythm right away. And I don't know exactly what I told you. I don't recall precisely what I said, but it probably, I saw the the metal and the glass and it probably made me think of the elements of earth. (laughs) <laughs> and then when the sun was hitting it and the glass was shining, it probably put me in a certain key. And that key from the, the term of music might have been a sharp key, E major, A major, D major, which are keys that sound really good on a guitar because the guitar is more brighter. The E's and the A's and the D's are, are just brighter chords. So I'm just sharing with you, music to me is a blend of alchemy 
and sometimes literally the the twelve tone system of music of Western music, which is talking about keys and chords and scales. That's very music talk. Those kinds of terms. I tend to be living in a space where I reference that, but I'm very I'm trying to be very self aware and also a bit spiritual about accessing the whole thing, the, those two worlds. Yeah. The scene Ratatouille comes to mind. I don't know if you saw that movie. I did. So Remy was introducing flavor combinations to his brother and they visually share on screen, hey, here's what it feels like to eat this cheese and here's what it feels like to eat grape and here's what it feels like to actually combine the two flavors together. So if I'm interpreting what you're saying to us, um, you look at the world through the lens of music and when you, whatever you see, whatever you learn gets interpreted sonically in your mind. Is that accurate? I, I, no one's ever told me that, I, that, that my thinking can resemble a, a rat in a cartoon from Pixar, but I love that movie. <laughs> and I love Ratatouille. And I'm just joking with you because I love, love, love Brad Bird. Brad Bird is the guy who did that movie as well as The Incredibles. And, but what you're saying, when Remy tastes something that he's worked so hard, his body floats. <laughs> he's tasting it and he starts floating and he starts twirling in midair. And the combination of flavors gives him an out of body experience. And yes, music has that effect on me. When the right harmonies and the right melodies come together with the right words and the right singer, I'm like, Get, I, either it's a box of Kleenex or I'm ready to party. It, 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 it takes me into every range of emotions you can imagine. So I think the reason I enjoy music so much is because it's a full range experience within my body and many times outside of my body. So I asked these questions not because I wanted to drill on you, Freddie, so much. I, I'm asking this question because for me, I learned to love music. And actually, music for me, as you said, was just entertainment, was an accessory to movies that I watch or whatever, right? It didn't really matter to me so much. It wasn't until a few years ago when I sat in plant medicine ceremonies when I was like, wow, this is amazing. Music is the emotions, it brings emotions, enhance emotions, augment emotions to everything in life. And it's a catalyst, it's a, it's a trigger to get me to that state that you were talking about. So, yeah. so these days, sometimes, not always, but sometimes I even shower with you know cine cinematic music or wake up with cinematic music because right away it puts me into that state versus generating it internally it ease me into that state very very easily what did i say all of that i forgot <laughs> that's okay you you know and you know what Let, wait, wait a second what a blessing you forgot you know why mm -hmm. because your brain went to that feeling you have when you put music on in the morning and it helped your brain kind of detach. And so as you were reminiscing and recalling the story, your, a part of your body went there too. So I want to say what a gift that you just forgot because you're basically sharing, we're sharing with your listeners that life in tune is not about totally being on point. Life in tune is about surrendering and allowing the little pleasures of life, maybe the taste of a salsa in a taco that you just bit into, maybe the, 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 the feeling of, of kissing your lady on the lips, maybe the feeling of coming out of the shower with a certain kind of music that makes your posture different because the French horn and the trumpet came in at right the moment that you're shutting off the water, right? It's all part of being in tune. It means that you are not judging yourself too much. You're not taking yourself too, too seriously. You analyze what you need. You learn what you got, but you also know how to have some fun.
Thank you for saying that. Absolutely. Music does help me not to take myself too seriously. And thank <laughs> you for dancing with me in this conversation. I remember why I said all of that now. So to me, one of the beautiful things that I, I, I did my research on you and all of your talks and everything. And one of the things that really was beautiful for me to watch you is you're a master of your craft. You're able to bring music in any situation and, and then using words and a combination of lessons I learned, as you said, rap wisdom around music. And the, the most poignant illustration of it is when you explain the song Summertime, you play it mechanically first, and then you add your personal interpretation and emotion into it. Sure. And that to me is an illustration of mastery. Can you say a little bit more about that piece? And then we can go into why this is important in the journey of learning. Sure. And, and I think part of it is, I think, I, I think to really give it justice, I think it's probably better if we use the keyboard. I yes. have my keyboard here. Yes. That I'm talking you know, about. One thing, one thing your yeah. listeners probably yeah. have figured out by now is that I, in my studio in Los Angeles, I have a desk. And the desk is a, a sit and stand desk. Right now it's elevated to about five feet so I can talk to you. But I have a built-in tray and an 88-note keyboard comes out of it so that in any conversation, any uh, phone conference or any Zoom conference I do, and I'm trying to make a point. I I've love got my, my piano right in front of me, right? That's amazing. <laughs> You're the only person who can bring who can who can do that on a Zoom call. <laughs> <laughs> so everybody, let's give credit where credit's due. Summertime was composed by George Gershwin, one of America's most uh, prolific and beautiful composers. And it's based on a blues, and the melody goes like this. Summertime, and the living is easy. Uh, so that's where the song comes from, Summertime. It comes from a very famous musical called Porgy and Bess. That's where it's from. So for those of you music people out there, making sure you look up Summertime from the musical Porgy and Bess by George Gershwin, because that's where this comes from. Now, many people in life, especially now, deep in you know, the year 2020, 2021, we have a tendency in our modern world to move very quickly. We're, we have a tendency to be bored quickly. You know, you have the remote control on TV. If, if you don't like what you see in two seconds, you hit the button and go next, next, right? If you're looking at your phone and you don't like what you see, you scroll. That's not, I am not excited by this. Let me keep scrolling. So, the ability to live in the moment is completely lost. So what people do is they take a song like Summertime and they're moving quickly. Like this. Now, amazing. it's a bunch of stuff, right? Mm -hmm. It has a lot of scales in it. I'm playing all the chords. I'm not really making mistakes, but so what? There's a very important factor that's completely missing. And that's called the space between the notes. And CK, a, a little earlier today in, in this discussion, you and I were talking about tempo, timing. And here's the thing, you know, we speak at about 150 words a minute. But our minds, the way we think, our brains move at around 600 to 1,000 words a minute. So you say something to somebody and their minds have raced way ahead of you onto something entirely different, right? This is a reality of the way people live. So your friend is telling you a story and they're moving very quickly through it. But you might come back to them and say, you know, I want to tell you this story with the right intention. So if I play this melody, that's the melody, right? But now I'm going to play it with a different intention, with a lot of space.
take it by time. That's the ending. Thank you. Amazing. So, same melody, same composer, but I was thinking about where am I? Who's my audience? I'm, I'm with my brother C.K. Lin on Noble Warrior, and we're sharing this time together. And the most important thing to talk about is the space between the notes. And maybe if I can carry that philosophy into the way I speak to the people I care about, my colleagues, my clients, my daughter, my son, my amazing lady Simone, my metal brothers, my community, my, the way I speak to um, my American citizens, you know, people on the right side of the aisle, people on the left side of the aisle, people in the middle, because I speak to all of them. And I have a relationship with all of them. And I know that the impact that I can make is going to be much better if I have space between my words and space between the notes. And maybe out of all the things you can use music to think about is think about the power of the way music touches your heart when there's a deliberate space between the notes and the ideas and how your body and your ears and your spirit can receive. Because everything we do in life is a mixture of the way we transmit and the way we receive. And human, the dance of being a human being is living in the states when you're receiving ideas and then when you're sharing and transmitting ideas. Mm. So beautiful. It reminds me of the first sentence of the Tao Te Ching. Mm. It says, if you can articulate, I'm paraphrasing, if you can say what it is, it's not the eternal way. So it's not the notes that's the message. It actually, more importantly, is the space in between. And metaphorically for me, whatever we wisdom, tactics, mindset, it's not it. It's in the discussion of the polarities of life that we find and we feel the truth of who we are and what the wisdom actually is being transmitted versus the, the words as the law. It must be this way. This is good. This is bad versus actually ex actively exploring what that truth in between going back and forth. CK, you just struck on what I believe is the most important aspect of our conversation today, right there. It remember, there's a very common uh, saying, people will never remember what you told them, but they will remember how you made them feel. And that's a fascinating idea, but it's a, fa it's a fascinating truth. People will not remember literally everything you, you tell them, but they'll remember, you know, when I met that guy, I wasn't sure what he was saying, but God, I felt so good in his energy, or I felt so good in her energy. People remember how you make them feel. Music is a, is an, a, is a craft, an art form, that is designed to make people feel. You know how many people say, you know, I don't know the words to that song, but God, that song makes me feel good. I forgot the lyrics, but it doesn't matter. It just makes me feel awesome. Most people don't know the words to every song they love, but they love the way the song makes them feel. You can think of the same principles in the way you deliver business. People will go, wow, I really love this product, but not because I know all the nooks and crannies and what's behind it. I just like the way it makes me feel. Mm. Products, services. Maybe the most important thing to tell an entrepreneur is the word serve. Services, mm. it's serve. Ultimately, we, 
are on this planet for a really short time. We're only here for a very short time. And in the short time that we're here, I believe with all my heart that we're here to serve each other. We, how do we help elevate all boats? How do all boats rise, right? How do we, how do we add value to each other? And I believe that if you come into the game of life with this attitude of how can I contribute? How can I add harmony? How can I bring my melody to collaborate in harmony with my colleagues or even a stranger or even, a, even an enemy? That's a whole other thing. Even somebody who's an adversary. How do you, how do you think more considerately of them, right? Which goes back to, you know, hold your friends close, hold your enemies closer. Understand your adversary. And then in that, formulate the right tempo and rhythm. And that'll get you to the score. And the score is the score is the is the final outcome of where you want to get to. It's your destination. It's your desired end goal. So th that's just sort of a general smattering of the uh, philosophy of life in tune. Thank you for sharing that. There's so many things to unpack. Well, let's start off with the atomic unit. The, the way I think about it is Confucius said it best, self, family, country, world. So it's fractal, right? So instead of going big, let's start small. So the moment that I met you, I heard you speak, I met you, I chatted with you. There's, I can't help but like you, right? You're, you're, you're that kind of guy. And, but for me, being social is something that I had to work on. Because I'm naturally an introvert and you know I'm very awkward in the beginning, so I had to learn to like, oh, here's how you talk to people. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyways, the point is, for someone who is working on or actively thinking about or being intentional about being more authentic, being who they are, owning their voice, speaking up in 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 ways that only they can, mm -hmm. what for someone like you, who is a master in you know, the way I see you, a master in expressing themselves articulately, beautifully, expressively, emotionally, precisely, what would you say to someone who is on their path to really owning who they are and expressing themselves authentically? I would re thank you. That question to me is how do you find your melody? What's your melody? What's your I am, right? The two most important words in the English language, I am. You can't really get out of bed and add any value to anything or anybody unless you know I am. I am strong. I am, I, I, I am a believer. I am a, a vessel of love. I'm a vessel of light. I am here to serve, right? But I am is your is your first starting point so you almost have to do exercises i like to look in the mirror when i was trying to figure things out and i'd start to talk write things down that i am right you know there's certain things that everyone is right uh, a woman might write down i am a mother i am a daughter i am an employee i am an entrepreneur i am a visionary right Th that's a list right a guy might write down i am a dad I am a lover. I'm a boyfriend. I'm a husband. I'm a, I'm a member of a beautiful group of people, right? They, they'll associate with what they do. People have to figure out what their passion and purpose is, right? I am an environmentalist. I am a believer in, I'm a believer in women's rights. I'm a believer in, right? You have to find your niche. You keep digging down. So number one is, is get, get down, get granular with what your skill set is, right? That's number one, because those, that's, that, those are all the little tools in your toolkit of who you are and what you have familiarity with. I think you got to know that before you can figure out what your superpower is, as you and I were talking about earlier. So number one, write down all your I ams. That's the first one. And then as you write down your I ams, to me, I like to do the mind, body, spirit piece of each one of those, right? I am a thinker. I am an inventor. I am, you know, I am an artist. That's all, that's all mind. 
Then there's things that are very spirit, right? I believe in God. I am atheistic. I believe in Buddha. I believe in the writings of Hinduism. I believe in, in the way. I believe in cosmology. I believe in self-awareness, whatever it is. But that's part of your spiritual I am's. Then you got to go to uh, your physical I am's. I am strong. I am, I am disciplined. I am a runner. Uh, I love martial arts. I'm a swimmer. I'm a hiker. I'm a, you know, I, I'm a tennis player, whatever it is. You have to write, you have to figure out where your mind, body, and spirit I am zone. And then once you get to that point, your, your checklist starts to get narrower. And you start to think about what, what your thing is. By the time you intersect your passion, your spiritual beliefs with the way your brain thinks, your mind, and the way your body processes and feels things, you start to formulate what you can add value with. Now, all of us have to uncover our superpowers. And once we do that, then we can start to talk about, I am an entrepreneur focused on childhood education. For example, right, right. You find then you're able to find your niche. By the way, the tighter the niche, the better. So if you go, I am an entrepreneur focused on childhood education in Mexico. That's even narrower, right? And and what's very interesting about life is that. There are always worlds within worlds within worlds. So even if it sounds like you're narrowing it down too much, you probably are not. Because you could talk about childhood education in Mexico and get very granular with that subject matter. You so could say, I right, childhood education in Mexico in the 1970s. And, it, and, and, and when you go into that rabbit hole, that's a world within itself. And you could spend your whole life studying childhood education in Mexico in the 1970s. My point is, is it's very good to focus on in a very granular way what you do. And there was a period of time where, you know, I focused on, on playing, uh, you know, Chopin. There was a time when I focused on that. There was a time when I focused on Albanus. There was a time when I focused on that. There was a time when I focused on Mozart. There was a time when I did that. There was a time when I focused on Boogie Woogie. Different times, different things. I believe that we all have to find our specific areas, just like you, CK, we're just getting to know each other, but you have a PhD. So there were times where you did papers, projects, and you went into rabbit holes of study, right? And, and came out with books and treatises and essays and all kinds of white papers and things to get where you got. So we all have to find our white papers, our essays, our areas to amass a certain level of mastery in, in our given subjects. But it all starts with I am. And the I am is your melody. And the melody is the thing that people remember about you. Mm. Quick recap, then I'll ask you a follow-up question. So what you mm. said is focus on the I am from identity to physicality to spirituality, right? Mind, body, and spirit. And then have a focus on a specific thing that you want to do and circling back to what you also shared earlier is you're always a student and sometimes you teach and that in itself also is a process as a way to practice being that identity yes accurate accurate beautiful so one thing that i you didn't quite talk about is the art of unlearning because in order to step into something else one may need to give up previous identities. 
Can you speak a little bit about that? And then before you answer, let me contextualize this a little bit. There's a phrase you hear a lot in the personal development community, be, do, have. And most people focus on having, most people focus on tactics and strategies, and then finally they get to the way of being. And the newest insight that I have is a way of being could be like a muscle, like anything else. You can practice being this new identity you want to step into. So what you just share about the I am to me is a way to practice uh, as a way to step into this new way of being. So going back to you, my friend, what are some of the processes that you may have as a way to unlearn your old identities and step into your new identities? I think the fastest way to learn anything is to fail. Like you're, you're, you're pursuing something and you hit a bump in the road. You're, you're, you're working on a book or you're, you're trying to impress a girl or you're trying to get a contract, right? And you say the wrong thing. You stick your foot in your mouth. You, you reveal something you should not have revealed. And you, and you make a mistake and the contract doesn't go through or you lose the girl or, or you lose a bunch of money because you thought you were investing in a good stock and it, it turned out to be a scam. Or, you know, all of us have these, I would call them trials and tribulations. All of us do. It's part of living. I think when, when I think you have to embrace the unexpected the dissonance that sometimes comes with it, the challenge and the change. And it's from that that you recalibrate and you learn. So what I'm talking about is when you know when you fall off the horse, it's the ability to learn, okay, I'm not going to do it that way. I'm not going to ride the horse that way or I'm not going to take that trail. I'm going to take the other trail next time. I'm going to use a different horse, right? There's a zillion conclusions you come to. But every one of the times that you fall is an incredible chance to let to learn. So I think that the, the expression fail fast, fail faster is a great one. I think when you have challenges, that's when you have the greatest growth. But right now, CK, we're talking in the middle of a global pandemic. I think all of us are, are dealing with a, a set of our own unique challenges. Some of them are global and are shared, right? Where there are some challenges we're all sharing, like the fact that my children can't go to school in the physical form and millions of other people around the world are experiencing the same thing. But I also think there's unique things that we're experiencing. And one of the ones for me is I've been a live entertainer and a live speaker speaking in front of, you know, 5,000 people, <laughs> that's over right for now, temporarily over. For the last 11 months, I have not been able to do that. So what I've been doing is delivering what I do virtually. And in many ways, it's amazing. And in many ways, it's, it's a challenge. And, there were, and when I was initially doing them, I had all kinds of failures, sonic failures, things not working the right way, just now things are, are working much better <laughs> and I'm, be, I'm able to deliver this all, all over the world. But the point is, is the failures are what are the only way we learn. So I think, I think, I think you got to embrace, embrace the challenges, hold them close, learn and, and overcome. Got it. So if I do a quick recap, if I understood you correctly, you don't even worry about the old identity. You just boldly step into the new identity and then embrace failing and winning this new journey that you are embarking on. Is that accurate? Yeah. I mean, I, 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 I don't always put on a suit of armor and do whatever I want to do. I, I'm, I'm a person who does, I do check the temperature of the water before I jump into it. I do have a, I do have a, a, a certain level of caution in me. I'm not a, there are some people that are, I wouldn't call myself 
on a scale of one to 10, a 10 is a risk taker. I'm probably maybe more of a seven. Yeah. You know, I look at the cliff before I jump over it. And then I look and go, I think I can land on my feet. And there's some water down there that I can jump. I can land in if I miss where I'm trying to land. You know, I think about consequences a bit. So I'm not a total risk taker. There are plenty of people that have that are much more, ch take chances much more than I do. But yeah. I do take a fair amount of chances. And my life and my journey has been one giant experiment. My career and the things I've done and the people I've worked with, you can't take a course in college. <laughs> And and take a course, uh, get an EMBA in this kind of journey that I've gone through. I mean, but, yeah, yeah. I mean, your career is uniquely yours. No one else can say there. And and then you bring this new flavor of bringing music into any kind of engagement that you bring in. That's totally awesome. So in the new reality that we live in, for me, one question that I really I think about a lot is how can we bring music into regular engagements, virtual engagements? Because in my mind, as you said, music is such a beautiful catalyst to take people into mood. And there's thousands and thousands, actually, I don't know, even know the number of millions of Zoom meetings happening all the time. How can we use music as a way to transform people's mindset? Because ultimately, if I recall correctly, your per your purpose in life is to elevate consciousness. Actually, I'm kind of oh, raising human potential through music. Thank right? you. So, how do you do that at scale now that you can literally be global anywhere? Curious to know your thoughts about about living your purpose through this new virtual environment. I think what you have to first of all, let's talk about the sandbox. Right. You know, when you tell kids to play in the sandbox, the sandbox is maybe 10 feet by 10 feet. There's a certain amount of sand in it and you have your pail and you have your shovel and kids for the next hour, you're in the sandbox. You cannot leave the sandbox. A zoom call is like the sandbox. Everybody, your, your face is going to be in a square. We're not even going to see your hands. We're just going to see you from the, from the waist up and we're going to see all the books in your bookcase. Or are we going to see another background of the Golden Gate Bridge because you like that Zoom background, right? Uh, <laughs> right? That's the sandbox, right? So I'm going to ask everybody, take care of your sandbox. Think about your sandbox, you know. I have a studio here in L.A. that I, I have artwork in my box. I have, the, I have my piano with me. Think about your sandbox because now... Remember in the old days, before the pandemic, the way you would present yourself is you had the ability to show up uh, in FaceTime on your iPhone. You would show up in person and you would people would see how you dress and people would smell your cologne or your perfume and they would look at your shoes and they would see the car you drove. And, and it was just a year ago when it was important to show up in a certain combination of fashion and style. Well, guess what? Most of that's gone out the window. People are wearing their pajama pants. They're, they're sitting, you know, they got a sweatshirt on. The lighting's bad. <laughs> they, they're not using headphones. They're talking through the computer, right? There's a lot of things that are happening now. So I'm going to tell people, take your sandbox because you only have a little square and people have to get a feel for everything that used to deliver fashion, style, communications, presentation. And right now it's astonishing. You see people showing up pretty sloppy, not taking care of themselves. And it speaks volumes, even if their credit credibility is, is great. We live in a world now where the camera is, you know, I'm talking to this little green dot right now. And the green dot is, is the world that I'm speaking to. So you gotta make love to the green dot. And you gotta, you got to present yourself. The other thing I would like to encourage everybody is have a way to show your hands. Now, I'm, 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 I use the piano in a big way. There you are, CK, you got your hand. You will be shocked with how many people 
are not showing their hands. <laughs> and the hands, I mean, if I want to emphasize something and I put my hands into my style of communication and I talk about moving forward or do mm. we retreat or do we move forward? The fact mm. that I can do this as I'm communicating is mm. really different than me being up on my camera and not being able to do that. Mm, mm, mm. That's the difference, right? So do you think I it's better to... for me to stand up and actually do the podcast going forward, just out of curiosity? I would love to more? stand up because I don't think of a warrior sitting down. Okay, thank you for that. I think of, I think of a warrior. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, if you ask anybody to draw a warrior. Right, it's the whole body. They're not sitting down in an yeah. errand chair. Yeah, they yeah. are. Yeah. They're, they're doing something with, with uh, positioning, right? Mm, mm, mm. So something to think about, right? Noble warrior. Uh, I am a motivational uh, keynote speaker. I am a musician. So for me, I couldn't imagine doing a call with you or anybody sitting down. I mm. never sit down. Mm. Thank you. That's great feedback. I appreciate it. Thank you so you much. It. I, I'm respectful of your time. Do you mind spending just a few more minutes with me to go through some rapid fire questions? Is that cool? Let's do some ra rapid fire. Rapid is the key word because I, I have another call coming up. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, it's totally well, let's fine. Let's do it. Let's do it. We, 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 this has been amazing. This has been an amazing time it's, with you, TK. It's totally great. Maybe, you know, Freddie, let, let's do this. Uh, I would love to do another part two with you. I want to just take a minute to really appreciate you for how you showed up on our call. You were open, you were, you were willing to dance in, in this conversation with me. We talked about living on a higher vibration. We talked about you know, setting our own rhythm in our daily lives. We talked about having music as a tool to live our life, the, our best life and, and our business. We talked about music as the oldest language. We talked about working with legendary artists. We talk about your learning process uh, or Carlos Santana's learning process. We talked about mastery and music. You demonstrated beautifully with Summertime. We talked about finding our own melody. I so appreciate your, your generosity, your warmth, and your enthusiasm. Thank you so much for being on Noble Warrior. Thank you, CK. It's my pleasure. All the best. <laughs>